By wisdom a house is built, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, verses 3 to 4. Hello ladies, and welcome to Homemakers Radio. I hope that you will be able to get a lot done while you listen to this. I hope to read you a story and uh, just talk a little bit about the challenge of the isolation and the opportunities of developing your talents at home and rising up from any apathy to bring the home to its full potential. There's a lot more that goes on here than you realize. And so I would like if you would go to my blog to watch this. I'm leaving a link here on the channel. There aren't any comments here, but you may go over to my blog and leave a comment and see what it's all about. And if for some reason blogger does not seem to be taking your comment, you're welcome to go over and find my email on the side and leave me uh, an email and I will post it for you. Today I'm wearing my Victorian costume and I feel quite teacherish, so I'm going to teach you in a one-room schoolhouse today. I'm going to be your teacher and I'm going to pretend that uh, I'm homeschooling you too. So you will get the benefits of this wonderful Christian education that I experienced once I started teaching my own children. It was just so rich. It's uh, too much to just put, a, put away in the background and in the history of my life. I want to, to tell you more about it. Maybe you would like to pursue it too. And if you're a teacher, I have often thought that teachers, many of them Christians, didn't belong in the public school but needed to to teach there because they needed to earn a living or thought that they wanted to help and so why not take some of these homeschool materials with you and teach them to the children and I think we could get our education system back if the Christian teachers would go and teach what they know is best and in the best methods not all methods and not all materials are good and there's such a vast difference between the Christian education the homeschool education and the public school education, I know because I've experienced both, that uh, you would see a difference in children's countenance and in their behavior. And they say that in Russia, when it became free from uh, the totalitarianism and the communism, that the president of Russia, I don't know what his his title is. Is he, is he a president? I'm not sure. Uh, he uh, wanted to let the Bible be taught in the schools just to get rid of the dullness in the children's eyes. Now, isn't that interesting? And I will tell you that something like uh, a reason for writing lit up my eyes. Um, now, my children were very young, and they just thought it was normal to write about such uh, lofty and heavenly things. But for me, it, it like my heart came alive. And so it is so true. And so today, before you go to work, there isn't anything here to watch, actually. I might show you a few things, but basically it's just uh, uh, some speaking so that you can go to work and I can keep you company and not get in your way. But before you go, I want to show you my teacup. It kind of goes with my costume. And the costume necklace is very interesting. My daughter made it for me, and it consists of a string of plastic beads that you find in your sewing section and a roll of very thin satin ribbon. And she draped them across the chair rails, <laughs> the chairs, in uh, I guess about four of them, and she wove them, she braided them together. And it looks like about four to eight layers. Uh, and I just love them, and she made me one in each color that I wanted to, and they're so lightweight. It's, it's just a soft cloth. And uh, I would like to have one for each dress that I wear because they, they're so soft. And often um, jewelry kind of um, it gets to feeling heavy after a while. And I just appreciate this kind of thing, especially like homemade stuff. So today I'm going to show you my teacup, first thing. I'm not sitting in the best well-lit position because I've got a lot of glaring light coming from the west today. And so on the east side of me, I look a little bit dim. But uh, you're going to be working anyway and not watching. And so the teacup today looks like a rose, doesn't it? Well, it really isn't a, it isn't, it's, I don't think it was intended for drinking tea out of But when I first started collecting teacups, I saw it in a thrift store. And it looked like a, 
I was so enchanted by it because it looked like a rose. Um, and I, I've collected it anyway because even though I don't drink out of it, it was probably sold in a floral department it's called Telefloral and probably had a rose in it or some kind of a plant in it. But I decided to go ahead and keep it. It looks real good in that in my little hutch behind me in which I collect a lot of other rose-shaped things. As a matter of fact, you can see a couple of other teacups there. You can get these, you know, on eBay. And they come in yellow and white, and orange and blue, many different colors I have seen. This is the one that I got, but I also had bought a few others to give away. And so I know that they exist in Teleflora. I wish they would reproduce these and sell them in the grocery store in the floral department because they're so pretty. I probably wouldn't drink out of it, but it's a. it looks nice on the tea table to put something in, like uh, little nuts or some kind of... Thing that you would eat um, and you would serve yourself with a spoon, a little serving dish. So ladies, now if you've got something to fold or if you've got something that you need to go do, you may do that and listen while you work. That's was the purpose of this, just like in the old times when we used to listen to the radio as we did things. But I wanted to uh, remind you today about how important it is to dress for the home. Now, the last couple of days I've worn these costumes. It's amazing what a difference it has made in the feeling that I'm getting. Uh, there's something about the way these clothes fit and the feeling of, I don't know, there's something historical about them, kind of con a connection there uh, that I have felt so peaceful wearing them. They're very comfortable. Now, they, there have been a lot of bad things spread about Victorian and, and pioneer clothes and they like they were uncomfortable and and uh, but that's not true I haven't found that to be true and most people who have gotten into wearing costume have discovered how comfortable they are and uh, you're not always tugging at something you're not always pulling something down and they they're just designed to fit you and stay put and so that's why I like this one I have had pictures of myself on in this in the past it's an old costume that I made and so I would like to talk to you a little bit about appearance. Now I'm wearing a Victorian costume because I wanted to. I just wanted to go about my house today wearing a Victorian costume just to kind of, ex you know, do you ever go to um, historic homes and someone is showing you around and, and she's dressed like a maid or she's dressed in a costume to explain what the family would have done in this room or that room or what kind of things were in there and something about the books or just about the history and uh, so I thought it might be interesting just as many times as we keep house as many times as we eat dinner as many times as we serve meals why not have some variety so I have dressed in costume the last couple of days just to get the feeling of what it felt like well I'll tell you the first thing it did for me is I didn't feel rushed no matter how bad the work had piled up I didn't feel rushed and you can't rush in these clothes anyway uh, they would catch on something so I have to grab the side of my skirt and move carefully and they also make me have better posture I'm not I don't slouch as much in them there's just something about the way they're constructed and it also gave me a, such a sense of dignity beyond what I feel in ordinary store-bought clothes of the day I uh, just gave me a feeling of peace and and the, the world became quiet for me and I thought of as I was folding clothes or ironing I thought of painting pictures and I thought of pouring tea and elegant things to do there's nothing wrong with that so one thing I'd like to ask you to do or not I'd like to ask you not to do is a couple of things I'd like you ladies not to do before I get into your appearance before I start lecturing you first of all I really was am so grateful for some people who have sent me packages but then I see the postage oh my goodness that doubles and triples the price of the gift it would be better if you just left me five dollars in the um, in the PayPal because this is costing you a great deal of money and being a homemaker and trying to subsist on one income maybe from your husband or just from your own retirement or something like that that'd be better not to do that to transfer goods 
across the nation. Uh, it's such an expense. And of course, you know, I'm in the manse. I'm in a little house and I want to be careful not to collect too much. I am using everything you sent me and I will always have room for another teacup. That's for sure. But uh, being, I just wanted to warn you, if you're thinking of sending something large or a lot of things, um, just be careful because of the cost. The other thing I'd like you not to do is please don't leave any more thumbs up on my blog, on my um, video channel. And I'll tell you why. I have um, tinkered with it so that it will not show anybody, uh, let the audience or anyone see the thumbs up or thumbs down. And the reason for that is, first of all, I don't want to, whether there's too many thumbs up or too many thumbs down, I don't want to capture the attention of YouTube or of anybody else because they tend to take things down. They get the attention of someone when they become extraordinarily popular and then um, when they discover they're not going along the, um, the lines of what they believe and that we're a little bit different, they're likely to take them off and then they shut your PayPal down too. So that is uh, one thing you, we want to avoid is getting too much attention. And so that's why it doesn't bother me. If I don't get very many views, it doesn't bother me at all. I only need 10 of you actually, or 20. 20 is a nice bonus. So I don't. it doesn't bother me. If you don't want to leave a comment, I used to ask you to leave comments, but you don't need to do that because I know you're busy. And one of the reasons I don't do live stream is because you'd have to sit there and watch the stream and, and leave a comment and converse. And I would too, and it is not as efficient as just uh, listening as you work. So if you have something to do, go ahead and do it and I'll try and keep you company. But if you're not dressed and you haven't taken care of your appearance, please go and do that. Now today with my Victorian costume, I have tried to look as natural as possible and tone down my hair and my skincare and my makeup because uh, they they did wear powders and makeups and colors and and things on their face but it was very very uh, toned down so I wanted to go with what I was wearing and but do something with your appearance at least do something so that you look fresh so that you look uh, healthy and that that you look like you're enjoying life and try not to look all like you've given up, all dried out, all uh, just disinterested in life, don't look like you've slept in your clothes, and and try to make yourself look uh, feminine and uh, look more girlish so that people at a distance can tell whether you are male or female. I've talked to you about that in the very beginning when I talked. I had several videos on royalty, on royal dressing, royal manners, uh, royal living, and how we're royal. And you know, the Bible, who are the real stars? Let me ask you that. Who are the real stars? The Bible says the righteous shall shine as, as the stars. You know, uh, in this situation we're in, in this national and global situation that we're in, people uh, that are the real stars have thrived on YouTube and done some beautiful things for people. They play their instruments and they sing a song and they they give it away free and you're free to donate if you want to and uh, there are people that do cooking videos and sewing videos and all kinds of encouraging things that they do for free and they shine like the stars but then you look at the so-called stars the uh, entertainers you know of Hollywood they're hopeless aren't they very few of them can do anything useful for for anybody some of them just videotape themselves uh, running up and down the stairs or just kind of sitting in a chair and complaining that they were they felt like they were in jail and uh, they're living in their million dollar homes claiming that they feel like they're locked up and <laughs> those of us who have been at home for a long time as homemakers learn how to make these places a, give them a sense of freedom and we can come and go as we want most of us have cars most of us have gardens. We are free to walk around. We're free to go wherever we want. We can travel and we're, we're free from being tied down to the schedule of the workplace or a school. That's one thing I like about homeschool is that you're not tied down to the state regulating when you go, when you get up, when you go to bed, when you take your vacation. 
You decide what day off you're going to have. You decide how much sleep you're going to get. And you decide for yourself what your schedule is going to be. You don't let the state do that for you. And as a mother, it can be quite frustrating running here and there to all the children's activities, to all the different schools, to all the different school demands. And uh, that's just ridiculous. And you can simplify your life and relax and feel less tension. And all your family will uh, suffer less if you decide to make home your center. So this is not a prison. This is a beautiful gilded cage, if you ask me. And so this is a challenging time of life, but it is also a wonderful time if you look at it the way the Lord looks at it, because God said all things work together for good. And I put that in the last, um, to them that love God, and I put that in the last post that I had on here, and I will put it on again. And so when you know that, you start looking for the good side of everything. If all things work together for good, let's see how that works. We all like to figure out how something works, don't we? We all like to figure out things, what the why and the cause. And so we start looking for the bright side of everything. And uh, this is one thing that a lot of people already knew that people that are homebound now are finding out. And it can actually be a wonderful adventure depending on your attitude. So what I'd like to say about your appearance is, first of all, um, consider it a breach and a violation and an insult to nature to ignore your appearance. And that is the first thing that you do before you start anything. I don't care if it's noon. Go and start over and get yourself prepared as though something important were going to happen. As a matter of fact, there will be something happen probably that's better if you will get your, your appearance taken care of. And uh, instead of saying, well, nothing's going to happen today, no one's coming, and, and I'm not going anywhere, get yourself dressed up and see if there's a change in that. You might be pleasantly surprised. Do you know, I even dress up when I'm writing a letter. As a matter of fact, when I put the Victorian costume on, I felt like, oh, I want to get my feather pen out and my paper and my old-fashioned desk, and I want to sit there and I want to write a letter to someone. So I did, and I wrote a letter to my little granddaughter, and uh, and then she likes these things too. So we trade ideas and we trade thoughts about these things, and so... When you dress up, you feel more like doing the right thing. You feel more like you want to get everything clean. You want to do the laundry. I have already hung out my um, sheets and pillowcases today wearing this costume. And I have seen so many paintings of the 1800s of women hanging out clothes. I'm going to have to include that in this, in this post so you can see... Uh, what did artists admire? To think that an artist would paint something that was so ordinary and so, I, I guess you might say, um, down to earth, uh, a woman hanging out clothing. And it just becomes, even modern artists, the, the contemporary artists will paint beautiful paintings. There are some people that were that are my age that are painting that will paint women hanging out clothes with their children in tow and basket of laundry and what a beautiful scene that is and it doesn't um, contradict the surroundings it doesn't contradict the nature and that's what I'd like for you to do is to dress in a way that doesn't contradict the beauty around you and some of the wacky clothes that we've that we've uh, put up with over the last couple of decades contradict life they con they're they're dreary they're drab they're or they are edgy and sharp, and they don't go with uh, the beauty around them. And uh, so at home, you don't have to dress like um, an industrial building. You don't have to dress in the colors of an office building. And so at home, you're free to dress as you like. Now, you might not like to dress like this. I don't do it very often, but today I just felt like I wanted to be a school marm, and I wanted to do a little bit of homeschooling, so... It's too good of a thing to put in the past. So consider it, um, consider it anathema <laughs> to, to ignore your appearance. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. You're not, you're not beyond um, 
taking care of yourself and you want to glorify God in your appearance like the Bible says and when you it's hard when you don't understand about God but once you get to get into the homeschooling like I I've, I've been trying to do for you you start to feel it more you start to feel the importance of um, dressing for a great God and for uh, for a gratitude um, of your life of, of having life and it's such a difference it's such a difference so don't allow any situation to degrade you to the point of not dressing and I'm sure that you're around people in your life um, who are critical and their their point is and their hope is that they can discourage you so there are some people that all they have to do is kind of walk past you in a room or in the hall and you feel degraded you feel like uh, you feel that you feel depressed because of them because of their attitudes their attitudes are so uh, discouraging and there are some people that you can be doing something you'd be happy you could be singing they walk past and suddenly you feel degraded so but you can't do that don't let any situation degrade you to the point where you can't stand up straight and dress well and look good and be happy and try to be pretty there isn't anything wrong with pretty we've been told even by religious people that it's vain and and that it's um, not intellectual that it's something we shouldn't focus on and, and and of course we agree that nothing is good to focus on to the uh, exclusion of kindness and and work and service to others but um, I think it's really important to do things like take a little time get up a little earlier floss your teeth and um, and take care do those things that uh, you might not think of doing um, just take some time to look after your appearance and so I wanted to talk a little bit now about home making and why it is so important because it goes with with your uh, preparing yourself for dress I'll tell you how it, it just interacts and that is if your home is nice and tidy and clean and especially if you can get your kitchen clean and your cabinets all cleaned off it elevates you it makes you stand up better it gives you dignity it gives you self dignity it gives you a sense of worth and this is what God intended when he when he created work in the beginning was that it gave it gives people a sense of worth it makes you feel uh, like you have some kind of control and on your life and on your home and it also gives you goals toward which to work and it also uh, broadens your mind it's amazing how you can feel um, weighed down with a messy kitchen and you can't think straight you get that kitchen cleaned up and your mind opens up and you start to be able to study and to learn and to develop in so many ways so that's why I say that the homemaking is just as important as dressing well for your home now one of the we have talked a lot about uh, pioneers and not just pioneers but I know in other countries where there weren't pioneers they had a history and uh, the 19th century history we call it the Victorian era but of course there was a history before that and before that too but um, it's very important to learn a little bit about it and because it makes you understand how you got here and why you're here and where you where you came from because we all came from one of those people didn't we we all had relatives who were Victorians even those who hate the Victorian era and hated Queen Victoria and hated the Victorian society and their morals and their all their uh, manners they were related to one of those people <laughs> so you can't get it out of your life but if you want to know a little bit more one of uh, the best stories I ever read or watched that was made into a movie it's I believe it's black and an old black and white one and it was called westward the women and it was with a an actor called Robert Taylor and he was the wagon master and that brought over um, a whole lot of women who had been corresponding with men in the West and the men in the West and they were called mail order brides I guess they weren't exactly mail order brides they were uh, they had been corresponding with these people and uh, they had a hard time they had a terrible rough time coming across 
you know, they, they ran into, they had to kill snakes and they had to um, rescue each other uh, from drowning and they had to, um, they had to endure so much and the heat and the, um, just the exhaustion and the dust and the everything. So when they got to Oregon to the place where they were to um, meet their future husbands, and these men were very, very looking forward to these women, to these women coming because they were uh, they interacted in helping uh, each other to go forward in life. Now today, I guess it's easier to be single, but it wasn't in, as easy in those days unless you had a father or a brother or some kind of help. And so they depended on each other. And in many, many ways. And I can attest to that because I grew up on a homestead with a pioneer type of mother and a father. Many people my age did uh, recognize that, that we all interacted and we all helped each other. So these men were waiting in this town for these women to come uh, on the date that uh, the wagon train was due. And the wagon train came in, and these exhausted women stopped short, and the wagon master said, uh, what's going on? They said, we're not going any further. They were close to the town. We're not going any further until we've had a chance to get a bath, to fix our, wash our hair, to put on clean clothes, and uh, fix ourselves up. We're not going to see these men in the condition that we are in. Now, I thought that's really interesting. If you watch this movie, it's called Westward the Women. I'll try to put a link on it to some place where you might be able to see it. Maybe someone has posted it somewhere. But it was so interesting because the wagon master went, went ahead and went into town. And here are these men waiting. And um, he said, these women have been through a lot. You're not going to just... Uh, just be able to run off with them. You're going to have to treat them very much like a lady. And so the men apparently all went home and they got a bath and they got dressed up and they came and they were prop acted properly towards these women, even though they were men of the Wild West. I live in the West now and I know um, they're not like the uh, gentlemen of the South, but um, still can be extremely uh, kind and helpful and protective. And that's what these men were like. And in this movie, it was so beautiful to see these women. They weren't all good-looking women. Some of them were, had been widows. Some of them were not real young. Some of them had come with a baby because their husband had died. Some of them, uh, they just came from all different situations. But the men were glad to see them because it meant they would have a companion and they would be able to um, work their way through life with a companion that's, you know, Bible says two are better than one because when one falls, the other one lifts them up. And so if you could get a hold of this movie, I especially like the ending. I didn't care for all the drama going on throughout the movie. It just like, I was just like this, you know, because these women were so brave and they were, uh, some of them had never had a hard life and they had gone across this Oregon trail and faced so much and then came into town to meet these men and just the wonderful civilized way in which it all ended was pretty amazing. So if you ever want to find out more, I think that was probably a little more accurate. It wasn't pretty, you know, it wasn't a, a glamorous uh, movie at all. Uh, I think it's a little more accurate uh, from some of the things that I've read about people from their actual diaries and letters. So, um, now, I want to also talk to you about figures of speech because we've had figures of speech throughout this series of videos, and I've always been fascinated with figures of speech, and I've seen figures of the speech in the Bible, and I have one more that I didn't even remember was there. When Christ said, if you have faith as the grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, um, move, and it will move. You know, you can move mountains. Well... That was a figure of speech, to move mountains. We often use that phrase, don't we? We could move mountains. Uh, so a, a good attitude is so important. What it really means is you can solve a lot of problems. You can overcome a lot of things. It doesn't mean literally that that mountain will move. It just means that things will move for you in your life. And a lot of people don't understand that, and they, 
they don't understand figures of speech, but to move mountains just means to remove obstacles in your life. And a good attitude is so important for that. And there was a set of scriptures someone gave me once that had these excuses, like, I can't do it, it can't be done. And then a scripture that would contradict it. And the scriptures were things like, uh, all things are possible with God. And um, whatever you you do, um, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And work with all your might with your own hands as unto the Lord. And just different things that contradicted this, these sour, dour attitudes. I don't think those, you know, light and darkness cannot exist together. So if you've got a sour attitude, you cannot be, you cannot be happy at home. And um, one thing that you have to have is a positive, good, uplifting attitude at home. You just have to shake yourself out of it because this is such a blessing. And if you could only think that every time you're complaining and every time you don't like it, you think it's the pits, you're one step away from losing it. Just like Adam and Eve, you know, they lost their home, uh, I guess, because they were listening to somebody else saying, well, you could do better than this. And uh, in a way, you know, when you analyze it. And uh, so just think of any time you feel ungrateful and you're in a funky mood, just think about how you could easily lose that home. You could easily lose it because if women get restless and they get discontent, they often uh, want to jump ship and go to something and get something better, but they're always worse off. So always look, uh, I think you should wake up in the morning and thank God for your life, for the shelter that you're in. You know, the Bible says uh, having food and clothing, let's be content. It doesn't mention shelter though. So I suppose shelter was just taken for granted. But for us, I think we need to know having some kind of shelter we need to be extremely grateful. I mean, even when I go out and get in my car, I'm so grateful. It's an old car, but I'm so grateful that I have transportation. And I think with gratefulness comes great reward. So it's kind of like uh, when you get in a, I, I'm warning you about having um, sour moods because this will destroy your homemaking. It'll destroy your marriage. It will destroy an arguing. It'll destroy your your influence on your children. It'll destroy your homemaking. It will destroy your creativity. Arguing is very, very bad for you. And one reason for arguing is that you might have the problem of having the news coming in or somebody giving you bad news. And so it contradicts how you're living. So then you start to argue. And one of the things people will say is, yeah, but not everybody can do that. And that's a... That's kind of a point of arguing to put you down when you're happy or when you're doing something or when you've learned to do something or when you've cre increased your skill or your happiness. Not everybody can do that. That's one of those attitudes. And that re I'm sure you remember the story, the little um, parable, I guess it's very small, that the uh, there was an eclipse and the moon said to the sun, how come you're not shining as bright as you used to? And the sun said, oh, uh, perhaps it's because the world has come between us. And you know, when you get to watch in the world and you get to thinking about what everybody else is doing and what the world is doing, then you lose the light because uh, the world has come between you and and God and, and you in progress and you in the good things and you in your goals and you and your creativity. You don't want to let that happen. So you can move mountains and don't let the world uh, come between you and God. Now I'm going to go a little bit into um, into uh, I wanted to tell you about a Napoleon quote that I found in one of the homeschool books, but I don't have the book. I couldn't find the book anywhere. Um, and that was, now there were several Napoleons, you know that, don't you? Those of you people in France, you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, he, when he was, I guess, in the exile, wrote to, the, to Christians that he, as a general, commanded armies of men and would be remembered in history. But Christ 
without even uh, fighting a battle, not even being a general in charge of an army, was adored by millions long after he died, generation after generation, century after century, and millions of songs had been written by him, and he's, his teachings is on the lips of every person and in the heart of everyone that believed in him. And so he was comparing himself, saying, uh, I might have uh, ruled certain parts of the world, but Christ ruled the heart. And I don't know which Napoleon that was. I just thought it was pretty fantastic. And ministers have used that in sermons uh, a time or two. And so uh, this is the thing about uh, the, the Christian religion and the Christian um, homeschooling is that it touches the heart. It reaches the heart. And so I wanted to talk a little bit, too, about... Um, about working around someone who's working on your mind. And we have this all the time. You know, everybody knows somebody that is constantly constantly trying to derail them, to distract them, that sort of thing. And then, of course, I wanted to tell you again about the news. If you're still watching it and you're still listening to it, I've given you a couple of alternatives that you can go to if you still have a thirst for wanting to know, you know, more. What We all want to know, don't we, what's going on politically. I think it's a wonderful era to be lived in because now we can know uh, there are no secrets and we can know exactly what our government is doing and exactly what the president is doing. And uh, you can find out what everyone's schedule is and where they're going, who they're talking to, if you're interested in that. But if you're not careful, that news media becomes a bit like a soap opera. And when you listen to, you know, he said this and she said that, it, it does, it does, sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? But what you're doing at home is so much more important because you're creating your own history. You've got your own politics at home. And so who are the real stars of... Uh, that's why what you're doing at home is so important because you're the star and your family, is, they are the stars. And what they are doing is so important. Your children will be so happy to know that you write about them every day in your journal. That you say something nice about what they did and they would love to, they would love to one day read it. So being happy at home is so important and your children will want to know that you were happy at home. They don't want you to be miserable at home because they will blame themselves. They will think that uh, they are part of the problem. So if you're happy at home, they will follow suit and they'll be whatever you are. They'll adopt your, they'll adopt your attitudes. And that one thing that's uh, noble about you is that you're doing this without pay. Your pay comes in the future. So also, besides uh, dressing up for the day, dress up when you go to the post office. Dress up when you go to anywhere, the grocery store, because these people that uh, that serve you have to look at all kinds of stuff all day. It must be very dull for them. But you represent your family. So your whole life is focused on your home and your family. So you're, all, you're doing it for a purpose and for a cause. And that's why I say... Dress up, get your house cleaned up, have a good attitude, work around people that have a bad attitude, recognize that they will try to derail you, they'll try to stop you from what you're doing. Many people are not very successful. They aren't very organized. And so when they see you changing, they see you being more organized, you being more successful in your life, and you dressing up a little bit, they feel bad. So they want to bring you down to their level so they'll feel normal again. And so that's one thing you have to watch out for. And then today, I have a couple of things to read to you. And one of the books I have is one of these Eric Sloan books. I don't know, some of you have all of the Eric Sloan books, but what they do, what he does is he goes through and finds the old uh, things people used to build and uh, shows how they work. And this one's called Our Vanishing Landscape. And if I can find the page that I found the most interesting here... This is interesting because I lived in the day from the, with the last of the hobos, the last of the hobos. And a lot of you don't know what hobos were. They were just people that carried a knapsack full of possessions, a bag full of possessions, and walked around from place to place. Sometimes they picked up work for a little while, and then they just move on. There's always been people like that. 
and uh, from the beginning of time there have always been people like that but they knew where to go to get food or to get a cup of coffee and often they would and, and people used to here's what people used to do they had these windows that they pushed up you know and when they baked a pie they'd set the pie on the windowsill to cool now today we wouldn't do that because we like our pie a la mode with the ice cream melting on top of it so we don't do that anymore but they put the pie out there and that some of them would put a pie out there on purpose because they knew a hobo would come by and and take it and so uh, sometimes I'm sure they got their pies stolen but when they discovered that they would put a free one out there and which I think is interesting but the last of the hobos they used to ride the rails the trains you know for free they jump on and ride for a while jump off and go into a town and so these were interesting people and uh, they weren't anyone you'd have to be frightened of they were just people that were down and out and just lived kind of from hand to mouth but this is about signs this book's about signs and it shows a sign that is carved into a post or a tree which you can still find in some places and that's one of the reasons I like for Mr. S to drive me around into out-of-the-way towns when we're on a trip to instead of going the freeway go the old highways because we get to go through the towns and you can see some of these things and they might be on old telephone poles but this they would put an arrow here and they would put a, a little slope here and they would put a number here and they would carve it into the tree and it meant things like good coffee ahead <laughs> or welcome ahead and it was started by this kind of thing was started by the circuses because the circuses were not always welcomed in America um, I suppose it was not thought of as being very wholesome the circuses so the circus people uh, in order they had to go and perform in order to make money so what they would do is leave markings on the post to say whether or not they were welcome in that town and they would leave signs for the next circus to come through and so the hobos took up this habit of and I'm sure you could find these in places where you have seen old poles or old things in old towns uh, where they could go and get food and they would have a, a marking that would indicate it was like a code and the other hobos knew about it and so and that was the first the first way of advertising because from there went the advertisement and advertisements came for uh, I noticed here uh, there were other things called um, vinegar and potatoes and they were written it was written on stones and trees and and that's where we get the word posted is on a post that's stuck into the ground someone would uh, tack on a piece of paper or something with words on it advertising something and so that's called posted because it's on the post and that's where we get the word post office because and that's where we get our posts you know on our on our blogs so I thought that was interesting and it's called our vanishing landscapes and it showed how the uh, fences used to be made and how different kinds of fences there were Victorian fences and there were other kinds of fences how the bridges were made and I got this for the boys but I had to stop myself because I would have sat here and read it all I thought it was very interesting I love the drawings of course the houses and it also showed where they would build a cabinet for you to put uh, for people to put their their preserves in which I thought was very interesting and I have the teacher's manual of the government and economics and this is uh, a Becca I think yeah it's a Becca book now why do I have the teacher's manual when I told you before not to get caught up in a teacher's manual because as my children became teenagers I wanted them to be able to learn what they learned and to be able to teach it but also because there's no secrets there was no secret there's no puzzle there's no anything I wanted to see what the teachers manual had to say so I'd give them the teachers manual and the textbook and I said just go through these both look what the teachers manual has to say that if you will read the teachers manual first you'll know what you're looking for in the text so this is these are some of the things so that way they became self-teaching and so that the a teacher doesn't have to stand over a teenager 
uh, from the time he's 12, a teacher doesn't have to stand over him. The mother doesn't have to stand over him because he's already learned how to learn. He's already learned how to look for things. So I wanted to read you some of the things in the teacher's manual. I can't find the textbook because, again, that was one of the things that was so loved. I think it was they absconded with it. And um, I'll just have to order myself a new one. So here is one of the first chapters, and it's called American Government and Economics in Christian Perspective. Now, if you're in another country, it wouldn't hurt to read this because you could do, this knowledge might help you with your own country. And like I said in my last video, the only way you're going to restore your country to what God wants it to be and what it should be and to, um, to, to the land of fair play and good government is to follow the Bible. And some of these um, things can be achieved through homeschooling because that's where their indoctrination is uh, in, the, in the government is to get the children and to indoctrinate them a certain way to uh, just go along with everything and not know how government works. But if you can grab one child, just one, your own, and train them differently, it makes a big difference and it influences a lot of other people. So I'm just going to read you a few things out of here. That is um, terms. This is, I don't know what the first chapter says because I don't have the, the book. But also the teacher's manual includes what is in the text. It also has the text in it. So sometimes it was cheaper for me to buy the teacher's manual because it also had the same text in it as the student manual. And I just give it to the child and they would just swallow, just absorb it. They just loved it. Okay. This is called Getting the Facts. Master the answers to the following questions about parliamentary procedure. Quiet scar, uh, quiet squire, <laughs> parliamentary procedure. Remember that from the quiet man? <laughs> and the Marcus of Queensbury rules. <laughs> what is parliamentary procedure? A means of conducting business in an orderly and efficient manner based on the customs of the British Parliament. Whose book on parliamentary procedure is still used as a basis for the rules followed by Congress? And I want to mention to you that our Congress, you can see it, uh, you can see our House of Representatives and our Congress uh, 24 hours, I think, because it's on um, television. They, they televise it so you can see what's going on. And you'll notice they have to follow parliamentary procedures. They're not allowed to talk all at once. They're not allowed to shout. They're not allowed to uh, disturb the procedures at all. There's there's none of that going on. And everyone has a certain amount of minutes to speak. They're not allowed to be interrupted. You're not allowed to shout them down. And that that is strictly followed or you get booted out. So whose book on parliamentary procedure is still used as a basis for the rules followed by Congress? Do you want to guess? Thomas Jefferson's Manual of Parliamentary Practice. Now, Thomas Jefferson said that after the uh, Constitution was written, that yes, we have a republic, but he said every so often you're going to have to have another type of, um, you're going to have to go back and correct everybody because they will stray from it. You're going to have to have a type of revolution where people throw off the tyrants because they're going to all creep in. You know, anytime you are a, uh, anytime there's goodness, it becomes a target for badness. So there, there are people that will wear away and chip away at your republic. So, and he knew this. So they did. And they, and often it had to, but through elections, it was supposed to be corrected. And now we're going through another one of those corrections where uh, our republic is being put back in order and our constitution is being restored. And if uh, you want to find out more about that, then go back and listen to all the X-22 reports on uh, that site and you'll find out. And so what book adopt, adapted parliamentary procedures for use by private organization and who is the author? I'm sure you know this. <laughs> Roberts Rules of Order by Major Henry M. Roberts. Why is the proper use? You know, we had to learn Roberts Rules of Order back in the olden days in the public schools. We did. Um, and that was the way the classroom was conducted. The teacher conducted the classroom according to Robert's rules of order so that everyone had to be orderly 
in responding to questions or in making comments. And that kept everyone, uh, it kept the uh, classroom civilized. Why is the proper use of parliamentary procedure needful? It allows people to conduct business efficiently and orderly, provides for majority rule, but protects the minority rights. This is interesting because not everything is majority rule. And I have to tell you, uh, to you outsiders, that we are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic, meaning that we're ruled by the law that, that is written, which is our constitution. And uh, if it were a democracy, it would be mob rule and it would be the most popular, whatever was popular or whatever the vote was. And then it would just, you know, because you can always persuade people uh, for something, but it, it might not be lawful. So that is why it's so important to provide the majority rule, but protect the minority rights and allows each individual to express his opinion and play a role in the conducting of business. Why is it important for each member of an organization to know how to use parliamentary procedure? Important decisions are made by those who know how to use parliamentary procedure effectively. And that is the way that um, many businesses become successful is through using parliamentary procedure and they bring out the best in all the employees and all the people that are on the board and um, try to glean helpful things from each one of them, let each one of them contribute, and there's not some kind of war for power. It's just to make better for everyone. And you know, a real, a real clever and accomplished minister or president or leader of any kind will not only make things good for the people that he serves, but for his enemies too. Somehow, they're always so good at uh, the changes that they make and the things that they establish and the things that they preserve not only protect the people that that follow them but and his constituents but also protect his enemies that's I thought that was really a, an interesting thing what is the first step in the forming of a new organization calling a meeting of all interested persons what is the difference between a constitution and bylaws the Constitution states the name, purpose, and basic structure of the organization. The bylaws set forth the details of how the organization is to function. Who draws up the Constitution and bylaws for a new organization? A committee which may either be chosen by the members or appointed by the chairman. In what two ways may prospective officers be nominated? From the floor by members or by a specially selected nominating committee? In an election of candidates for an office, what do the terms majority and plurality mean? Majority means mo more than half the votes. Plurality means more votes than any other candidate. In what four ways may voting be done in an organization? A show of hands, a voice vote, the ayes and the nays, a roll call vote, or the written secret ballot? What does the chairman do in order to enter into the discussion of a question of new business? He asks another officer to serve as a temporary chairman, then waits to be recognized to speak. In what ways may a proposal in the form of a motion be disposed of? By passing or defeating the bill as it is presented, amending it, referring it to a committee, postponing it until a, def a definite time, postponing it indefinitely, which in effect kills the bill or tabling it. Okay. That might have been a bit dry for you. So now I'm going to read out of my Guffey Reader, Readers, which kind of goes with my costume. And I'm um, going to read the second part of the character of, of the Pilgrim Fathers of New England. What I would, uh, so first I want to tell you what we're supposed to be looking for here. Okay, this is the way I would actually do it uh, with students. First I'm going to ask the questions so that you can listen for them. What should be especially inculcated in regard to the virtues and the defects of our forefathers' character? How ought to re we to regard our rights? Is this a spirit of war? Did our fathers never fail in this respect? How shall we regard their piety? What shall we say of their austere and rigid severity? What course ought we to pursue? Now, in the interest of time, I'm only going to read a couple of numbers here. These are all, the paragraphs are all numbered because the students would have taken turns reading this. 
um, our fathers were pious, eminently so. Let us then forever venerate and imitate this part of their character. When the children of the pilgrims forget that God, who was the pilgrim's guide and deliverer, when the descendants of the Puritans, when the descendants of the Puritans cease to acknowledge and to obey God and love God, for whose service the Puritans forsook all that men chiefly love, enduring scorn and reproach, exile and poverty, and finding at last a superabundant reward, when the sons of a religious and holy ancestry fall away from its high communion and join themselves to the assemblies of the profane, they have stained the luster of their parentage, they have forfeited the dear blessings of their inheritance, and they deserve to be cast out from this fair land without a world without even a wilderness for their refuge, <laughs> you know. That's what we always said in the old days. Somebody would complain, you know, about the country, and we'd say, well, you're welcome to leave. Um, Let us still keep the ark of God in the midst of us. Let us adopt the prayer of the wise monarch of Israel. The Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us, nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. Uh, so then, uh, let me read this last paragraph. Let us attempt at least to maintain ourselves in so desirable a medium. Let us endeavor to preserve whatever was excellent in the manners and lives of the pilgrims. While we forsake what was inconsistent or unreasonable, then we shall hardly fail to be wiser and happier, happier and even better than they were. Okay, children, <laughs> now I'm going to show you the icing on the cake. This was a book I ordered called Ostentatious Crochet. I just thought it would be interesting. And Ostentatious Crochet. And uh, But as I got to reading it, I discovered that probably the crochet in, uh, instructions were written in the English style. And that's different than the American uh, style because we have different a uh, different code, and something might mean something else that won't turn out. So I thought so, but I'm not sure. I haven't actually tried any of it, but I got it because I liked just the the title and I liked the pictures, and I, it was a beautiful book. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures from it, and I just thought there it's very delightful. It's feminine. It's sweet. It's soft and it's nice to look at and so I wanted to show you one of the finished crocheted uh, pictures and this reminds me of the costume that Lady Harriet was wearing in Wives and Daughters when she rode on her horse to lecture Mr. Preston for compromising Molly, sweet dear Molly, by meeting her uh, secretly uh, for some reason and how what a bad thing it did for her reputation. But I remember that she had that costume on. I'd really like to have a pattern for that. I don't think I want to take the time to crochet it, but I liked I like what it looks like. And then I wanted to show you something else really, really cute. It's a little girl's shawl with her doll shawl. And I will put a picture of that on the post so you can see it. Ostentatious cro cro crochet. And I can't pronounce the... Uh, the name of the author, but I'll put that on my blog for you. So ladies, uh, I want to eventually write about or, or talk about the uh, Acadians, Acadia, Cajun, and the Canadians and how the Canadians are related to the people in Louisiana, which is quite fascinating, but it would take a whole hour to talk about it. And some of you in Canada already know and so I thought that uh, that would be interesting because I ran across it when I was talking about something else here. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what that is. So everything is kind of interconnected. And especially in the 1700s, people were getting around quite a bit. You know, they uh, shipping was a big deal. And they say the oceans were just covered in ships and sails and uh, that, that people didn't... Uh, they weren't stuck in one place that they went a lot of places and so they explored and there are there's evidence that many of them came into faraway places evidence left behind by them so ladies until I see you next time I hope that you're dressed up I hope you're happy I hope you get your home the way you like it 
And um, that's one thing that I think that your husband can help you with is to make it possible for you, if you don't like something, to have it repainted or redone or just done so that uh, things arrange so that you can uh, function and be happy at home. It's very important for you to be in a good mood because it uh, sets the tone of the home. It, it sets everybody else's mood. And her presence lights, lights the home as the Bible, as, as the old saying goes. And, of course, the Bible says that women should be um, guards and guides and keepers of the home. So I hope that you will enable yourself to do that. And until I see you again, God bless you, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye.